Welcome to our fourth Universalist service video. My name is Reverend Skylar Vogel, the senior minister here. This is video from our service on March 21st, 2021, which was a special service, a shared service between three historically Universalist New York congregations, one in Rochester, one in Canton, and of course us in Manhattan. In this video, you will hear reflections from our three ministers, Reverend Lane Campbell from Rochester, and she will speak on the past. I will speak on the present and Reverend James Galinsky from Canton will speak on universalism's future. Following that, we hope you'll join myself and Ember Kelly, our Director of Religious Education for our lively discussion of where we'll go deeper into the service and what universalism means in the past and the present and the future. If you like what you see, we hope you'll check out our video and audio podcasts each and every week. It's posted on our website, on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, and also your favorite podcast streaming sites. We also hope you'll give us a positive review. You'll like, comment, share, and subscribe to help spread our fourth Universalist media further. Thank you again for watching. Hi, everybody, and welcome to our Time for All Ages today. Uh, my name is Ember Kelly, and I am the Director of Religious Education at the Fourth Universalist Society in the city of New York. And I am really excited today for our Time for All Ages to be joined by Michelle Yates of the First Universalist Rochester and Carol Zimmerman of the Unitarian Universalist Church of Canton. We, ha we had a lot of fun thinking about how exactly do you do a time for all ages when you have three directors of re religious education working together? And so we decided to record a little something and I will let Carol introduce. Good morning. So today we will be hearing the story of the invisible web by Patrice Parse. It's a tale that tells us about how we are all truly connected. And we are connected historically as universalist congregation we're also connected as Unitarian Universalists. And of course, lastly, we're connected because we're all humans. So let's hear more from Michelle. The Invisible Web. The very best news ever has begun to spread all over the world, one heart at a time. Shout it from the mountaintops. Every single one of us is connected to those we love by invisible strings. That means Giovanna and her daddy are always together, even though he moved to a new house. Omar can feel the tugs of love from his parents, even though he is living far away at school. Mr. Chang still feels Mrs. Chang close by, even though she died such a very long time ago. And you, at this very moment may feel the string of someone close to you, even though they aren't right there. You can't see it, but it's real. Our strings reach to everyone we know. They travel far and wide, to families and friends, classmates and coaches, to bus drivers and babysitters, neighbors and pets, to aunts and uncles, and grandparents and grandchildren and countless other people. And all of those people have hundreds of strings. Soaring high over the rocky peaks and across the seven seas, deep into jungles and valleys, and winding through the busiest of cities, all these strings crisscross over one another and create a nest that covers the planet, interlacing us together cradling us forever, the invisible web. The web has no borders and wraps every continent. Within it live butterflies and flowers, starfish and seahorses, lions and ants, rivers and snowstorms, and all human beings. Giovanna, Omar, and Mr. Chang, and of course, you and me too. Some say it even reaches to our ancestors and those we cherish in the beyond. One tug on a string sends love to every one of us woven together in this divine tapestry. And that means just one good deed travels across the entire web. Everything is linked. 
But sometimes folks forget. When they can't feel their string, they forget about our invisible web. And that's when strings get tangled up. Like when lonely Louisa isn't invited to sit with anyone at her school at lunchtime. Or when sad Stefano wishes his friend Marcos wasn't so bossy when they played. Or when Mrs. Patel struggles at work without help and she just wants to quit. Even violence and war can erupt when too many of us forget the web. When strings are ignored, they can become weak and begin to unravel. But the more people who care for the web, the stronger it remains. The web feels like every parent since the beginning of time, holding and protecting each one of us in millions of gentle arms. What could be stronger than all those hands holding us close? So many supportive fingers can always find a way to untangle strings so that love can flow again. But it's up to every one of us to spread the word. Our time is right now. As we tell our family and friends, sisters will remind brothers who will write to cousins who will call their great grandparents, who just nod and smile as if they've always known. If we remember the web and tug at it often, nobody will ever be left out. We will see others more clearly. The people of the world will look into each other's eyes. They will smile at one another. And when one of them cries, they will all want to help, and they do. Marcos apologizes to Stefano, who forgives his friend, and they have even more fun playing. Someone helps Mrs. Patel at work and tells her what a great job she's doing. She remembers that she's important and feels happy. And Luisa feels warm and bubbly inside when a few of the kids in class ask her to join them under the banyan tree for lunch. She knows right then that the invisible web is real. After school, Luisa cries with joy as she strokes her cat who purrs the news to the stars. And the stars whisper the secrets to the clouds who share it with the songbirds who serenade the world with this exquisite melody of love at the start of each morning and all during the day. Until as the invisible web glitters in the magic of twilight, the owls take over and hoot the news throughout the night. The invisible web is alive. Its time is right now. It breathes as we breathe, pulsating all over our earth, the single heartbeat of life and love. And do you know what that makes us all? One very big family. P.S. I just love being right here in the very middle of the invisible web with you. I just love being right here in the very middle of the invisible web with you. I just love being right here in the very middle of the invisible web with you. The invisible web that connects us all. We are connected historically as universalist congregations as currently Unitarian Universalists and as human beings, may we pull on that web so that we do always remember how connected we truly are. Though we cannot all be seated together, I'm sure all of us wouldn't fit in any of our church buildings. We are still connected in this larger community of Universalists, of UVUs, of human beings. Please join me in closing our story time after this video with an embodiment of the invisible web. So after we stop, if you would please change your screen setting, your view to gallery view rather than speaker view and to extend your hands 
to the edges of your screen. So it's almost as if I am pressing my hand against Ember's hand and against Carol's hand. And I want you to look at each screen and imagine pressing against the hand of each person in each screen, people you know and people you don't, to feel and know that we are all connected. Thank you for joining us for this story time. You are with us always. This morning, uh, Reverend James Galasinski and Reverend Schuyler, Schuyler Vogel and I will be sort of exploring universalism's legacy, past, present, and future in the ways of what is binding us together as well as what our call to justice is in this moment. It is my privilege to start us off in the past, and I'm so in honored to be invited here to be with you all this morning. The church that I serve, the First Universalist Church of Rochester, is getting ready to celebrate our 175th anniversary since we incorporated as a worshiping community on April 13th of 1846. That is amazing. It is no small feat. It has been such a long and complicated road to get to where we are today. And that 175 years aren't quite the whole story of this community. As Universalists, we, get, we began to gather in our community of Rochester as early as 1824. The Christian intelligencer shared this creed that the Universalists of that time were gathering under, and I want to share it with you all this morning. We believe in one eternal, unchangeable, and infinitely wise, good, and powerful Lord God, who is the sole creator, proprietor, and governor of the universe, the common father and impartial benefactor of all mankind. We believe Jehovah, who spake in time past by the Jewish prophets, has spoken to us by his Son, Jesus Christ, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, and by whom, as the mediator, he will bring all his intelligent offspring to eternal purity and happiness. We believe virtue and happiness, vice and misery, are inseparably, are inseparably connected as cause and effect, and consequently, in order to be happy men, must do justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with God. When I hear it today, I, I love the old language, and it certainly points out that there are many of us in this virtual worshiping community who are not quite included in this statement. Our theological heritage is one of universal salvation, a belief that all will be saved. But did we really mean all at the beginning? Not to my knowledge. We really meant all Christians. And we really meant all white folks, people of European descent. And we also meant maybe women, and certainly not those who identified as non-binary, trans, and or genderqueer. We began with this amazingly beautiful aspirational theology that all would be saved. But we set this dividing line around gender, around race, around class often. I learned this past week that Fourth Universalist Church was called the Church of the Divine Paternity up until the merger of Unitarians and Universalists. I imagine that our congregation in Canton has a similar theological legacy and heritage. We are siblings after all. And I point out this heritage not to poo-poo the past or to condemn these folks, but to say we have some roots we have to atone for, my friends. We have some roots that are just a little bit rotten. Our denomination has its work cut out for us in owning the ways these theologies were formed in the midst of white supremacy and patriarchy. Though I love, I love, I love this message of universal love. This idea that all will be saved, though that is quite a loaded word and concept in our present day. Though I love the ways we want to talk about the history of our universalist ancestors as if they always held love at the center. It is simply 
not the case. It was more complicated than that. They struggled to truly live into this inclusive vision shaped by who they were at the time, a group of mostly white folks whose times heralded the supremacy of men and upheld this vision of God the Father, the vision of the brotherhood of all mankind that leaves out so many of us who are now here. When we look to our past, it serves us to also see the theology of Francis Ellen Watkins Harper as a guiding light as well. These words Reverend Dr. Sophia Betancourt shares of hers were uttered just 20 years after First Universalist officially became a worshiping community. And her acknowledgement that we are all bound up together was a challenge to the universalism of its time as well as a challenge to how we live out our call to live into universalist theology in the present day. Friends, as we turn from the past to the present, I would bet that most of us today don't think of universalism as universal salvation, the idea that all of us will be saved by God in heaven. But it has been replaced by a general commitment to two ideas. The first is that universalism means theological diversity, pluralism, the part of our faith that says you can be a Christian or Jewish or atheist or whatever. The second is that universalism means that our communities are places of welcome. We are the religion of the open heart, open mind, and open arms. Come, come, whoever you are, we like to say and sing. Universal love. Both of these versions of universalism are important. I wouldn't be a Unitarian Universalist if they weren't. I'm not sure there is anywhere else I could truly be myself. Here I am at home. And I bet that's true for a lot of us in all three of our congregations. But as the world has changed, the limitations of theological diversity and welcome are starting to be laid bare. We see their limitations in their passivity. All they require is letting people through our doors and allowing them to stay. We confuse tolerance with radical welcome. We equate easy declarations of loving everyone with the difficult work of systemic change. We see their limitations in the belief that theological diversity shared by mostly white, educated, privileged people is some great accomplishment, that it represents meaningful diversity rather than a predictable variation within a largely homogenized group, that it bridges any true or tender division within our society today. We see their limitation when we avoid challenging conversations, how we, can av how we avoid calling out destructive behavior and hurtful words, because we don't, because we want everyone to feel welcome, and by everyone, we usually mean those who complain the loudest and take up the most space with the greatest privilege. All the while, those who are hurt and made unsafe by our lack of boundaries and accountability, those who represent perhaps real diversity, leave believing we are hypocrites. And we see their limitations when we hesitate to be bold in our convictions or actions, because we don't want to privilege one belief system or another, to be too political, offend the status quo, or make clear that we don't have creeds, but we should have values. These limitations of our present universalist theology force us to ask a simple question. Does this form of universalism have answers for our world today, for the crisis of our time? Is it life-saving, transformative, radical? We know that our world is suffering and hurting and divided. We need a faith that offers something real. We saw the brokenness this week with the horrific murders in Atlanta, and we've seen it all year with the 150% increase in hate crimes against Asian Americans. We see it across our country in the Jim Crow laws being passed. 
turning our nation into a sham republic. We see it in the regular instances of police brutality in Rochester, where BIPOC people are being murdered by the state. And we see it in the class divide in Canton and elsewhere between university and working class and who matters, who is prioritized, and in all the resentment that follows. In this kind of world, does the universalism of theological diversity and tolerance of those who join us have much to say? Does it offer us a way forward? Does it give us the tools to face these oppressions? Does it offer us life-saving hope? Friends, I don't think it is enough. The universalism of the future cannot be simply about being together in congregations with different beliefs and making people, mostly those with privilege, feel welcome within them. That is fine, but it will not save us or our world. If we cling to those, they become like a golden calf, mockeries of a deeper truth and potential of our faith. We have to think bigger. We have to work harder. We have to be more creative, feel deeper within us empathy towards that push for systemic change. We have to be part of that struggle for liberation. And that is where our future lies. May it be so, amen, and blessed be. I recently had a Zoom call with Dr. Sharon Welch, the retired UU social ethics professor. Is there some embodied metaphor for the sacred that can speak to us, speak us into the future, I asked. I asked the self-proclaimed mystic and atheist. She responded by saying, there are no concepts, symbols, or images of God, goddesses, gods, or divinity that I find intellectually credible, emotionally satisfying, or ethically challenging in the face of evil and the complexity of life. But surely there is a natural and spiritual side to human living that looks up at cloudless nights, sees the grandeur of the many lights, wide open to life and knows and senses we are all bound up together, even with the stars. Some metaphor for that. She then explained how she lives elevated on the 18th floor of a concrete and steel structure overlooking the buildings of Chicago and the oceanic blue of Lake Michigan. Because of the pandemic or for whatever reason, they stopped cleaning her windows. Spiders quickly moved in and soon webs covered her windows, giving her a different new murkier view sometimes with pebbles of water coloring the lake and the city in Roy G. Biv. The interconnected web of life provides for us our essentials of home and food as it does for spiders, but the sacred relationality lets us see the city, the lake, the alfalfa field differently and new. Our togetherness is divinity. This same mysterious web linked Reverend Schuyler and myself before we were even reverends in Milwaukee many years ago and randomly intertwined Reverend Lane and I on an airport shuttle in New Orleans five years ago. Now I know much has changed over the last 251 years but the call of universalism still remains the same now and into the future. The sticky web of love won't let us go. This web is a collective wisdom that's really actually right in front of us. Just, just look at your computer. Think of how many hands and minds over how many generations gave us all this technology. Our web has invisible sacred strings, the tug, 
between bus drivers and babysitters is an invisible web of gentle love flowing through time. So good riddance, creator God, master of the plantation, God of white masculine self-reliance, hello, sacred, universal, mysterious web. Challenge us not to do justice work because it is the right thing to do or because we want to be on the right side of history or we want to help people. When society tramples violently on others, may we, with the lens of the web, know it violates our own souls as well. The universal web is a metaphor, sure, but it is manifested in how we are together. The web of universalism says that no matter your gender identity to whom you express your love, whether you are indigenous, a person of color, white, where you were born or your immigration status, we are bound together. No matter who you voted for, no matter how many master's degrees you have or do not have, whether you got stimulus checks or didn't, beekeeper or bureaucrat, the web keeps pulling and progressing and pushing us to live more tightly bound together. So look out into the world clouded with a web of shared DNA that goes back to the earliest forms of life. Look out into life with a shared air breathed by many ancestors. The stars are calling to us, bound up in oceanic blue. May we all see anew the many manifestations of mutuality that are before us. Amen and blessed be. So Reverend Schuyler, I'm really excited to get to sit down with you after this, uh, this big, cool service. Uh, I mean, it was, it was really cool looking at the, uh, the attendance and just seeing all these names that I've never seen before and seeing so many new faces. It was really, it was really cool to get to gather digitally as, as these three communities together. It was, it was, you know, these joint services that allow us to be together, even when we are far apart. I mean, Rochester and Canton, they're not as far as ways Ireland, uh, as we've done joint services with those folks. But if you look at the map of New York State, there we're kind of a triangle. Rochester is very far west, Canton's very far north, and we're kind of at the bottom. Uh, and so our communities that would never have a chance to get together in person uh, did that today, and in some ways represent uh, three of the most um, active and I think vibrant universalist congregations left in New York State. Yes, it was it was really cool. And it was, it was great to get to spend this time reflecting on, on universalism. Uh, obviously, we, we all three are these congregations that come from this universalist background that we are the fourth universalist society in the city of New York. I think the universe, they, they did love their, their, uh, their long names for, for naming their congregations. And their numbers too. Uh, that's true, true. For first, first and fourth, I think we were today. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, they did like their numbers as well. So the, these are, you know, some observations about universalism, <laughs> but I'm kind of curious. Uh, I wanted to just spend a, a minute talking about for both of us, what what is universalism uh, in our lives? And obviously as, as people that are on staff at a uni historically universalist congregation. So what, what does universalism mean to you? I think for me, it means a number of things. It means this idea of radical love and radical welcome that extends beyond creed, beyond differences, beyond um, who we are, what we've done, where we're from, that there really is a universalizing uh, nature to human beings, and in some ways the universe, that we are all in it together and we should treat each other like that. That for me feels like a very core universalist principle. Um, the other that we kind of talked on a little bit is, is the, the transition from universalism as, as a purely relational theology to, to universalism as a, a, a societal theology, a, a, a theology that speaks to not just how we as people should treat each other and see each other, but how, how we should uh, see ourselves within the context of a larger society, within institutions, within structures, and how those structures and systems impact our humanity as well. So the idea of going beyond just, you know, we all love each other to 
we can't fully be loving beings that are fully whole and reaching our full potential without addressing these structures and systems of oppression and inequality. For me, that is a much harder form of universalism because it means going beyond just sort of a vague, ambiguous form of we all love each other, we can't, can't we all just get along to what are the, the systems we need to change that organize us as a society, as human beings that both push us down and keep us, keep us from actively living out the loving nature that we have um, and then what are those structures that fulfill that universalizing, you know, empathetic uh, humanism that sees each other's value and worth? Because that is really real. And unless we address that stuff, we're not going to be able to live out that the interpersonal love that I think um, the more sort of present and maybe the more historic universalism preaches. Definitely. I mean, it seems a, a, a more liberation focused universalism. Uh, you know, for me, I come obviously from my Christian theological background and, uh, you know, I apologize to all the folks that may have heard this story before in other conversations. Uh, but during my interview process, I, I did talk about how I had this, some, some universalist uh, street cred that I, that I did have a background in thinking about things this way, even though my, my background was in uh, evangelical Christianity and then uh, more just liberal Christianity. Uh, but in, in my time at a, at a conservative seminary, I actually wrote a paper defending universalism as an as a orthodox idea. And this was actually uh, it was pretty controversial for, for that sort of setting. Uh, and, but I, I did get an A for a well-argued paper that uh, said that, yes, this was actually something that people in the early history of Christianity believed. Uh, so that was, you know, really, really powerful. And it had actually drawn from uh, in, in high school, uh, we had a, a teacher who was something called an annihilationist. I think I pronounced that right. Uh, forgive me, theology professors, if I did pronounce it wrong. Uh, but uh, basically, he believed in hell, but he didn't believe that hell was forever. So he believed that uh, people's souls would be destroyed at some point. And he pointed out that like, hey, it doesn't say that hell is this for everything in the Bible. In fact, it doesn't talk very much about it. And so he headed for this direction because of his view of God. But I said, you know what, like if, if God of the universe is this loving place, then that's that's not really the view I want to have, that, that everything will be annihilated in the end. Uh, so, um, you know, it was, it was a multi-year journey for me. And I, I find it really interesting that I didn't end up at a the cathedral of universalism. Uh, now at this point in my in my career, and it uh, it, it feels good to be embracing this this more liberatory vision of universalism that you were talking about. So, um, so speaking of theological legacies, theologies, um, uh, we talked a lot about the the history of universalism in these messages, and interestingly enough, uh, this this coincided well with the fact that you're offering a three now four week course on the history of fourth universalist. So we've, we've been thinking a lot about our own theological and historical legacy here at fourth universalist. So what are, you know, some of the things that you think that universalism has to, to grapple with, maybe even with examples from our own congregation? Yeah, it's a great question, Ember. And, and the service today addressed some of that with uh, Reverend Lane's reflections about our, our past that universalism didn't mean really everybody back at the time, at least here on Earth. Uh, you know, universalism, like most of the world, was uh, you know was heavy, heavily steeped in white supremacy and patriarchy and heteronormativity. Uh, all these, all these things that that kept on Earth people's dignity from being restricted. And universalism was part of that. Um, Fourth Universalist was part of that. Our name, historically, for most of our history, was the Church of the Divine Fraternity, and uh, and that at the time was was supposed to be positive. God was a loving loving parent rather than rather than a vengeful uh, parent, which a lot of Christian traditions then saw God as, which was very terrifying for a lot of people. It instilled a lot of trauma in people's imaginations uh, from childhood onwards, and so. So there was a lot of liberation freedom that came with feeling the relief of being, gosh, I'm, I am okay, I'm gonna be fine, God's gonna take care of me. But it didn't mean that we were, we were in any way universal in our appreciation of the people around us. Um, you know, fourth Universalist was 
largely against slavery during the Civil War, but not exclusively. We had we were largely a merchant congregation, and that meant that there were a lot of people with money in our community who had business dealings with the South. Uh, we see this in a lot of Unitarian Universalist communities, uh, particularly in New England, where there were huge textile mills. Uh, and in order to make cloth and, and other textiles, you need cotton, which at the time were harvested in the South by slaves. And if you were to abolish slavery, your free source of cotton, your low price cotton that comes with not paying people anything, uh, suddenly vanishes. And so there were a lot of people at Fourth U, uh, at the Church of the Divine Paternity as we known then, that, that were adamantly against, against uh, abolition, against emancipation, and were vocal about it. Um, we have, we have uh, history of the minister at the time, Edwin Chapin, being aggressively pushed by those people to be quiet about his opposition to slavery. And he was hardly, <coughs> he was hardly a radical. <coughs> I've been talking a lot today. He was hardly a radical. He was not an abolitionist in the sense that we think about abolitionists. Abolitionists were actually very radical people. They were people who you wouldn't see in high society. Um, they were, they were a bit like what you could imagine Antifa people being, or sort of Black Lives Matter activists um, to a lot of a lot of folks. Uh, you know, Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Most of the people in good standing were. Neither was Chapin. He would vocalize it, but he wasn't an activist, uh, and he still got pushed back on. So we have these legacies, right? Um, uh, we were there, but we weren't really in the fight, right? We were content to say our piece and then go home. And of course, for those people who are in bondage, who are being uh, oppressed and killed as slaves and having their children ripped from their hands and sold into slavery, us speaking out as a congregation was hardly anything better than complicity. And, uh, and so we can wrestle with that and, and you know, further legacies of, of that. You, you can go on, right? Uh, in some ways, it mirrors the the historical legacies of America, um, you know, slow steps towards progress and often several steps back. Well, I, and I think, you know, it leads to what you talked a good bit about in your reflection, which was this idea that uh, we still often, our universalism often often privileges that, you know, we, we have this idea of universal love and acceptance and we want everybody here. Uh, but as you said, it's it's usually at the expense of, of the marginalized that we we let those who have privilege have money, have the big voices, uh, and that uh, we we let them push somebody like Chapin in, in our history. But you know that that legacy even still continues today for the UU world as a whole. I mean, it's why we're discussing things like the eighth principle that we're we're trying to grapple with even the privilege that that still exists in our communities nowadays. Um, you know, I think. Uh, obviously, you, you talked about that in your, in your in your reflection, but I'd love to hear any like additional thoughts you might have on that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Amber. I, you know, it's a lot easier to say we should all love each other, and this is the place where everyone belongs. It's a lot easier to say that stuff than actually do the work to make it actually happen. Not just in our congregations, but in our world. You know, you can open the door and say like, whoever wants to show up here, you can show up here. We won't be mean to you. Um, it's not that hard. It's like a pretty low bar of universalist theology. Um, the harder work is to, to do the work to make sure that when people show up that they actually feel comfortable and embraced. Uh, and the even harder work is to go out there in the world and realize that like actually what happens in our little spaces, in our little congregations is just a small microcosm of the larger world. And unless we do the bigger work of societal change, then our universalism, the fact that someone can sit in our pews uh, you know, isn't really that important in the scheme of things. And so our work has to certainly be inward, but it also has to be outward to, uh, to make sure that, you know, we can, uh, we can confront the great spiritual crisis of our moment uh, and crises, because there's a lot of them. But we can't, it's not going to, those aren't going to be addressed or fixed by us saying like, well, if you're an atheist and a Christian, you can hang out in our church together. Like, that's not, that's not going to save anyone's life. Um, you know, it can be great, I couldn't be a, you, you know, another religion because I'm a humanist, but also I love earth centered traditions. And I like listening to um, the uh, standard lectionary some mornings uh, to ground me. Uh, I'm a motley person of all these things as I know many of us are. And so UUism is really good for me and really perfect and I love it. 
and also like it can't just end there because that's all about me um, and about my needs and my place of feeling home. And so my work then is to take that out and, and look at what is preventing people from feeling at home in the world. And, uh, and that's not just being accepted for your theological beliefs. It's about feeling safe. It's about uh, not worrying about hate groups, you know, shooting up your place of work. It's about uh, feeling free from the police. It's about not worrying about your kid getting health insurance, right? Um, that is, you know, we talk about like what love actually looks like. Um, just saying you're welcome in a religious space is very lit, is nothing compared to, you know, when we live in a world where people don't have health insurance and worry about the state killing them and their family. Um, you know, so I want us to think bigger about what universalism can mean. And it means recognizing that like safety in our congregations is, um, is a first step. And we're not even there yet. You know, there's a lot of microaggressions that happen in this life at Fourth U and, and other places. Well, I think, you know, there, there's so much there that I just want to uh, dive into, but I'm, I'm going to keep myself uh, focused on, on the direction that I was, was planning to ask a question on. Uh, but so, you know, I think that this, uh, you know, this is this, this liberating web. We talked in the Time for All Ages. We talked in, uh, in the third reflection. Uh, we we discuss this idea of the web that, that connects us all. It's the seventh the seventh principle, um, and obviously this web means that you know in our communities we create these safe places, like you said, and we we make these places where uh, the the individuals who don't quite fit in the boxes of other congregations. I, I also echo that that sentiment uh, can can more fully belong, and we can live more fully in those congregations. But if that's not turning out to this external web of the rest of the world, then what, what good is that work doing if it's only, um, only creating uh, a, like a very closed off community? It's not spreading the web out to uh, and acknowledging the, the, the liberation of the wider world that we have to be uh, willing to sacrifice and do really hard work for. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it speaks to the point of church, right? Like, are we is the end goal of church and religious community the fulfill is the continuation of religious mm. community. Um, there's a powerful uh, line somewhere in the Bible that in, in uh, after uh, that in heaven, there are no churches or after after um, after the, the the second coming, there is no churches that there's there. They have, they don't, there's no need for them anymore um, because society has been, the world has been achieved uh, of justice, the heaven on earth, right? Um, and if a church puts itself out of business because the world is so full of love and so, so full of justice and freedom and joy and hope, it is okay if people don't need to gather on a Sunday morning and have a minister talk at them uh, and have coffee hour because they're getting their, because the world is that, right? So in some ways, our work is to make ourselves obsolete. Um, for now, we are little corners of the world that try to replicate the world we wish to see in our own little small communities. But if our goal is just perpetuate religious community on and on and on, on forever, it's a deeper thing than that. Definitely, definitely. I think that is a beautiful place to, to end our time of reflection here. Uh, I really appreciate all the work that went into putting this service together. I know uh, from the perspective of, of the DREs and how much uh, work, collaboration, and configuring out all this together can be. Uh, so I appreciate all the work that you as well as the other ministers uh, put into, into today. And thank you also then for, for sitting down with me as well. Thanks, Amber. And, uh, and you uh, DREs did a fantastic job on that video and telling that story. It's a beautiful story. Uh, it was fun to see your YouTube editing uh, at work uh, and displayed for three congregations. And, uh, and hopefully we can do more of this universalist togetherness in the future. Definitely. And thank you, as always, to all of our listeners. And thanks for joining us today.